going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. We are cautiously optimistic that what we're seeing right now is presenting itself as a much milder virus than had first been feared by the initial cases identified in Mexico. Despite this somewhat encouraging analysis, the outbreak of the H1N1 flu in Mexico has caused schools to close, people to don masks, and scientists around the world to swing into gear to understand the threat that this new strain of influenza poses. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. The appearance and rapid rise of a new strain of influenza has sent fear, literally, around the world. The strain, called swine flu in the press and more technically referred to as H1N1 influenza of 2009, was first identified in Mexico. It rapidly spread around the world. By late last week, 896 cases had been confirmed in 41 states of the United States. and also. Although the news has tended to focus on cases in Texas, two and a half times that many had been identified in Illinois. New virulent strains of flu, whether H1N1 or the scare around the H1N5 avian flu threat a few years ago, lead people to try to benchmark the threat against what is considered the deadliest plague in history, the 1918-1919 Great Influenza Pandemic. That pandemic killed between 50 and 100 million people worldwide. Accurate numbers of dead in developing countries, especially in India and China, are simply impossible to determine and the toll in the United States was approximately 675,000. Those numbers are staggering. 13 years ago, I prepared the following story on the impact of the flu in Cincinnati. Last year's flu was aggravating to many and potentially deadly for the very old and the very young. But in 1918, the so-called Spanish flu was different. It attacked young, healthy adults with lethal quickness. Margaret Woolenweber was just three years old in 1918, but she still remembers what happened to her 23-year-old mother, Ruth Schneider. It was Christmas Eve, and we had Santa Claus and the whole bunch there, and my mother passed out, and I remember him taking her to bed, and that was the end. I mean, she lived about a week after that. Compounding the threat, millions of men were living in crowded army camps as World War I ground towards its terrible end. The flu swept the world's armies. In fact, fully half of the American military deaths in Europe were the result of flu, not bombs or bullets. On the home front in Cincinnati, preventive action included washing downtown streets with disinfectant, closing any factory when 5% of its workforce came down with flu, and shutting down the schools for nine full weeks. Things got so desperate, by early November, city officials even took the drastic step of shutting down Cincinnati's famous saloons at 6 o'clock every night. Despite these measures, medical officials were overwhelmed and confounded. By October, every day brought 500 new cases. Hospital wards bulge with sick and dying patients. To discuss the current flu threat, I am joined this morning by Professor George Smullian, the Associate Director of the Division of Infectious Disease at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. George, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. Um, obviously, we don't want to overblow what's going on, and that's why I used uh, the, the, the soundbite uh, with the Secretary of Health and Human Services at the beginning, but we also don't want to underestimate the importance of what's going on right now. Given where we are right now, how do you see what the, the threat of this flu is and what do you think about our response so far? I think thus far our response has been appropriate. I think that it is an area of great concern, but we don't have enough knowledge yet as regards how this is going to pan out. And therefore I think that it's much better to respond aggressively up front and then be able to cut back on the, ish, on the response than to underestimate the significance and be caught um, without, within an adequate planning or inadequate response and have to deal with things afterwards. I've seen this flu and the flu in 1918 and a couple of others referred to as shift strains or shift flu where this is not just a modification of an already existing virus that's out there, but 
the introduction of something that's significantly different and therefore much more deadly. Is that what you understand this to be? That's correct. Normally, um, the flu virus undergoes a pattern called drifting, where there are small changes that occur each year or over progressively over time, and that leads to subtle changes and makes us susceptible to the flu each year. Um, but when a significant shift occurs, suddenly you, you've got a population seeing a virus that either they've never seen before or is significantly different to the one that they've seen before and therefore has the potential for causing much more severe outbreaks. One of the things I've, been, I've noticed in news reports and it's out there on the web, uh, uh, photographs of the current virus, and we've got some um, that we can we can see of the the H1N1 virus, which don't look like much to untrained eyes. Is it? Do we know much about what this virus is at this moment? We know a tremendous amount already, given the. Um, how short the um, period of, that we've been concerned about it over the past six weeks or so. Um, you know, the entire sequence is available, the comparison of the sequence between multiple different isolates from various centers throughout the world, as well as a number of the, uh, many, many of the isolates here in the United States, that can, has been compared back to historical um, versions, and that's allowed us an, degree of an analysis that has never been, has not been available in previous outbreaks. It allows us to look at what areas it's similar to the 1918 flu and what areas it's different to the 1918 flu. Before, uh, before we pursue that line of yeah. conversation, there is also a diagram I found of the 1918 flu virus. Now, okay, it's an interesting colored photograph. But from a scientist's point of view, what do you see? What, what is it about flu in general, and what is it especially about that 1918 flu that was so deadly? I think that the, um, our postulates as regards what were the specific virulence factors, what are the things specifically that made it much more aggressive than normal f flu viruses. Um, firstly, that uh, those sort of yellowish barbels on the surface called the hemagglutinins, uh -huh. um, that the type of hemagglutinin that it had appeared to be um, associated with changing the immune response to that virus, and that response was thought to be one of the major things that allowed the high mortality and the number of deaths associated with it. Secondly, in the um, inner portion, um, some of the enzymes that are encoded with that result in the replication of the virus, um, there are differences in, that, in those proteins and that DNA structure that also have been associated with better replication and more efficient replication. And those are the areas where they can now compare this current virus with that and ask, um, you know, is this, uh, make postulates as regards whether it's going to behave in a similar or different way. Whatever happened to that flu, that strain of flu? Over time, it mutated. Over time, it, it in itself drifted. So it, it is still out there in some sense? Well, derivatives of it derivatives? are out Derivatives okay. are out there. That particular strain was reconstructed based on um, isolates that were obtained from a patient who had been buried in Alaska in the permafrost and therefore were able to re, uh, recreate the strain from that. Mm. And now animal experiments have subsequently been done to try and work out why it was more virulent, uh, being done in ferrets in, uh, and in other animals to try and assess the virulence. You know, the, in the popular press, the current outbreak of flu is referred to as swine flu. And a few years ago, we were worried about avian flu in birds, yeah. and a lot of birds were destroyed, especially in Asia, uh, to try to protect, to stop it. What difference does it make? Does it, does it make a difference where the animal, you know, what animal is passing it around? It, 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 or is that irrelevant in the long run? It most probably is irrelevant in the long run. There is some relevance in the different animals' influenzas have an, are easier to transmit to humans. So the efficiency of a human um, influenza virus is its ability to spread firstly to humans and then be transmitted from human to human. Traditionally, avian flu viruses are more difficult to spread to human 
and are poorly adapted to spread human to human. So they would have to undergo greater changes to acquire those um, properties. Swine flu, on the other hand, has always been one of the ones which are more easily transmitted to humans and usually maintains the ability to transmit human to human. Ultimately, the virus that's seen in the human becomes adapted to human to human um, transmission. And then do humans pass it back to other animal species? That certainly can happen, though, you know, we're um, you know, more concerned in the long run about human-to-human right. -human transmission, but um, the animal species are often the melting pot, w the cauldron where all of these things get together, pick up different factors from different um, swine flus and or different flus. Swine flu is thought to be, or swine are thought to be an important component of this in that swine can harbor both their own virus can harbor human virus, can harbor mm. avian virus, and therefore can be the cauldron where genetic mixing can occur and lead to new strains. Mm, that's interesting. Now, in the 1918 flu, one of the things that really confounded people at the time was, unlike the flus they knew, or the grip as it was called yeah. often at that time, it wasn't just lethal to very old or very young. In fact, it seemed to be really focused on young adults that were seemingly healthy. What is that? Are we seeing some of that today? And why is that? So we certainly are seeing some of that today. Uh, not in the deaths, thankfully, as yet. But if you look at hospitalizations, mm -hmm. Most of the hospitalizations that have occurred have been in the under 30 year old group. Whereas with classical seasonal flu, for example, most hospitalizations and most deaths occur in the less than five year old and greater than 65 year old. So this is behaving differently to seasonal flu and more like the 1918 type of flu, pandemic type of flu that we see. The postulates as regards why that behaved differently in 1918 um, are there are a number of things that have been postulated. One is that the elderly population who might have still ha who might have otherwise been susceptible could have had some degree of protection from a flu that came around in 1889, right. and therefore they might still have had some residual immunity based on that, and therefore didn't get sick as sick as predicted based on previous immunity. At the same time, the flu, the 1918 flu, appears to have caused a different type of immune response. And it was often not the, it's thought that it wasn't the influenza itself that killed, but the body's response to the influenza, what was called a cytokine storm, that the body's response to it um, was this massive outpouring of um, things to fight the influenza and that caused the, the deaths. Um, in the elderly, another area, sort of area of that um, hypothesis is that the elderly's immune systems were weakened and therefore not able to mount this tremendously huh. overpowering response. And the same with young children because their immune systems are not as well developed yet that they didn't mount this overwhelming response and therefore were protected by a weakened immune system rather than a healthy immune system. You know, one of the things people are taking some comfort in that it doesn't, this flu doesn't seem to be quite as deadly as maybe first feared or whatever. But again, looking at the 1918, 1919 example, isn't there a potential cycle here? We're seeing this flu emerge at the end of one flu season. And isn't there a historic sort of pattern of when it comes back in the fall, the next flu season is when the real danger is faced? Certainly the 1918 flu had that sort of double phase thing. It came through in the um, late spring, early summer, and um, was a concern at that point in time, but it came back at late summer, early fall, and that's when most of the deaths were, uh, were seen. Um, we don't know enough yet as regards what's going to happen, and that is a big concern. Uh, it has, t in tropical areas, flu is a year-round situation. Mm. In temperate areas, it's classically a fall or winter disease. 
Um, so it, the virus has time to continue its mutation, continue its maturation process over the next period of time. And what we see come back in the fall may be different to what we're seeing now. And I'm about out of time, but given yeah. that, do we have time to develop a vaccine? And who do you think, and I know this will be, we'll have to determine this as we get closer, who do you think it will be recommended to take that vaccine? I think that, you know, advances in the te technologies and the methodologies that we use to develop vaccines have allowed this time frame to, to be a re reasonable time frame to be able to develop a vaccine. Uh, you know, a four to six month period is sort of the lead time that we need to develop it. Whether we'll have absolutely adequate supplies on the first day of yeah. fall may not be so, but we will certainly accumulate them over as the uh, flu season progresses. I think that, you know, the recommendations as regards who will um, who would be recommended to get the vaccine are partially going to be driven by what we learn from the Southern Hemisphere. We have, the, we have a window, luckily, to, to see how this flu behaves as it moves into the flu season in the south, Southern Hemisphere. We can then sort of assess who's getting sickest, who would be the people at greatest risk, and therefore who we should direct the vaccine towards. This has been really interesting. I've really learned a lot this morning. I want to tell people that if you're interested in learning more about the 1918 flu, the great book is John Barry's The Great Influenza, and it's a really fascinating book. And if you want to keep up with the influenza threat and suggestions about how to respond to it, check out uh, the the um, uh, Center for Disease Control's website, www.cdc.gov. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Stay tuned after the break, the latest results from Strive about the status of learning in Cincinnati, Covington, and Newport schools. Welcome back. This past week, Strive, an educational partnership designed to help greater Cincinnati children succeed by looking at the entire learning process from birth through early childhood, elementary, high school, and college years to their successful transition into a meaningful job. The focus is on the inner city school systems of Cincinnati, Covington, and Newport. Committed to making decisions about investment of resources based on reliable data, last year Strive published its first progress report, a sort of snapshot attempting to establish baselines of data that could be used to measure future trends. This past week, Strive issued its second annual report, and to discuss the significance of this report, I am joined now by Jeff Edmondson, the executive director of Strive, and Jeff Zimmerman, an analyst who works with all of the numbers and all the research that Strive undertakes. Jeff, Jeff, well, I can't get this one wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, welcome to Newsmaker, Jeff, welcome back. Thank you, thank you. Um, as the executive director, what is it that you think is the big insight from the second, uh, the second report, the second year of data that we have? Well, perhaps the biggest theme and most encouraging theme coming out of the report is that on 34 of the 53 indicators, we are making progress in this community. And when we usually hear the negative stories around educational opportunity um, really focus just on K-12, if we look at the entire spectrum and we look at the progress we've made over the last, the last year from birth, straight through some form of college, there is a lot to be encouraged about. That said, uh, as we'll discuss, there are some things that we need to address, but uh, as a partnership, as a community, we can make progress. Okay, let's take a look at one of the key indicators is preparing people to enter school. And I've pulled out some of the data uh, so that we can see it. And this is about young children. If we look at what Cincinnati, Covington, and Newport, remember, and what I find interesting is that in Cincinnati, 48% are determined to be prepared. That's up 3% from last year. In Covington, 71%, up 6% from last year. Uh, Newport, 62 up 8%. But the benchmarks are all different for each of those cities and school systems. Jeff, what, why? What, what, I mean, you're the numbers person. Right. What's going on yeah, here? Yeah, I think a, a really important point with, with this data is that you can't really compare the three cities because this particular indicator prepared for, for kindergarten 
uh, the measures are different. So each of the three cities are using different tests. So okay. it's really to look at each individual city and see how the progress is as opposed to compare because they're just not apples to apples. Which is one of the real challenges. We're a metropolitan area, but in this sort of thing, it's not only the school systems operate differently, they actually use completely different tests, and so you're measuring differently. As Larry Johnson, who's the, who's the leader of the data committee, said, I think last year on the show, good data will drive out bad data. And over time, what we're hoping is that we'll see issues like that get addressed so that we could do a comparative analysis. But what's, what's really positive in that data is that the work of Success by Six um, that's being led by the United Way is clearly seeing uh, some, some positive impact. And those are the kind of things that we need to highlight and then build on. Sort of moving in the right direction exactly. in this early childhood area, which we is have, good we have, to know. Which is great to know. And in, in education and in social services in general, we have a history sometimes of making progress and then moving on to the next thing. Well, if we look at the data and we understand what the data is telling us, maybe we can stay committed to what's working over the long term to really get better results. And one of the things that your report says is that it's really important to look at the data and make judgments about scarce resources in this economic downturn and where we're going to keep investing. So not moving on too quickly, but also investing in the right places. Is that right? That's exactly right. We can we can uh, we can be much more purposeful and uh, I think wise in our investments if we really look at the data to to, to be. Uh, uh, to make sure we're investing in those things that are having impact. I want to take a look at some numbers that jumped out at me uh, about sort of achievement in certain schools. We look at this, Cincinnati Reading uh, currently 65 percent down 2 percent, whereas the benchmark is 79. Cincinnati Math, this is eighth grade by the way, Cincinnati Math, 54 percent down 3 percent and the benchmark is 58. Jeff, what do you read from those numbers? Uh, how important is this? Well, I think they're important numbers to look at. Um, I think you need to look at the entire context, though. And um, if you look at the change from the baseline year, especially in math, in, in, in the math scores, and this is true not just in Cincinnati, but in Covington and Newport, but there's been increases since the baseline year. And the baseline year has been four years ago. And there's actually a pretty big jump, I think about 17 points or so. OK, so from the baseline year, so any one year, you have to be careful. Right. Right. But and one of the things we wanted to do in this report that we didn't do in the first report was identify trends. And, and really, if you only look year to year, you're going to miss the picture. You need to look at four years' worth of data, understand where we've been headed. And if we see a small blip from year to year, but we've seen consistent progress over time, we need to stay committed to what we were doing. But one of your principles is sort of here, you have three mm -hmm. sort of basic points you make at the beginning is rigor in the classroom must improve because high school graduates are not prepared for college. And we're going to move on to some data. Mm -hmm. But rigor in the classroom, mm -hmm. how do you get that to happen? Well, I think what you, what you have to do is do exactly what this partnership is all about. Bring multiple community leaders together to figure out how we can collaboratively work and support initiatives that are getting results. And right now, for example, in Cincinnati Public, uh, there's been the talk of opening an office of innovation that will push more rapid improvements in those schools that have been struggling for years. Or in Covington, they're going to create an early college, which is where you put a community college on a high school campus. Mm. These kind of creative ideas that have been proven in other places and even locally to, to drive success, those are the kind of things that as a partnership we need to get behind. Okay. Let's take a look at um, college, ready, uh, college readiness. I found these interesting. Uh, Cincinnati State, 7%, uh, I guess these are indicating of fully ready. Uh, NKU 22 percent, UC main campus. Is this nothing but a reflection of how selective uh, these admissions are on these different campuses, Jeff? That's part of it. It's that these numbers are based on the ACT cut scores essentially for the colleges. So each of the colleges that we worked with uh, looked at the data and kind of determined what percent of students um, fell below those cut scores and that's how that's reflected. So that's part of it, but it, it also does reflect um, kind of the level of preparedness across the board and it's not consistent across two years and four years, but across the board in general, uh, students aren't as prepared as they should be when they enter college. Jeff, I got less than a half a minute here, but final point, what should people take away from this? And we're going to send them to the report here in a minute. Well, there were, there were really three themes that the, that the pace of improvement needs to pick up 
that rigor in the classroom needs to improve and that we need to make sure that kids are able to enter and then succeed in some form of college. Uh, and we have a, an event on June 26th where we'll be delving into this data a little bit more and offering the community a chance not just to listen, but to actually engage okay. and provide solutions. And if you would like to see the full report, go to Striving Together website at www.strivetogether.org. And then June the 26th to talk about that, and we'll be reminding people. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the men and the women working to shape our region for the future. Have a good week. Very good.